You're done, this is when you walk out. What you said? Why? Did you take this quiz? I took the quiz, I'm done. That's not a good attitude. Come on. Do I drop a quiz grade? <laughs> Have you not figured out that Zach is a pretty nice guy? <laughs> okay, okay. He, Zach will be kind. Zach went through this himself. Um, he did cry a little bit. But, uh, what am I looking at? Hold on. What am I teaching today? Oh, yeah, I'm teaching this. That's what I'm teaching. That's awesome. Okay. So we're going to talk about some uh, some interesting stuff today uh, that's not quite as technical as what we've been wading through. So I think you'll find this a little bit more enjoyable um, and insightful, hopefully. But I, I hope that everything that I say you find insightful. Uh, I'm just kidding. Um, but uh, what we're going to do, so we, we have thus far very quickly obtained four equations of motion, four, <laughs> three really, these are the same, three equations of motion. Uh, we also wrote down the Lagrangians and then we got these equations of motion by applying the whole of Lagrange uh, equations to the, to the Lagrangians for each. But anyway, we've got an equation of motion for a free scalar field, we call that the Klein-Gordon equation. We've got the Dirac equation, which describes uh, spin a half or spinner fields. And then we've got uh, the Proca equation, and I don't know if I actually got to name it, but this is the Proca equation, which describes the spin one vector field. And it's similar to Maxwell's equations, except in this case, we're allowing A to have a mass term. If you just set the M to zero, then you get back half of Maxwell's equations. But for now, we're gonna stick with the massive vector field. And then later, we'll talk about the massless cases. Okay, so in your homework, you proved something rather interesting about this expression. What did you prove? Let me get a card. Kowalski. Uh, you proved that uh, any solution to the Dirac equation is also a solution to the klein gordon equation. Yes, so what you did was you took this expression and you basically operated on the left of it with this operator. And then you did a little bit of gamma massaging. You ever had a gamma massage? It's wonderful. They do a lot of like one. flipping your organs back and forth. And anyway, all right. So, um, and you demonstrated that the Dirac equation or a solution of the Dirac equation would satisfy um, basically the Klein-Gordon equation. Okay. Now, to give an interpretation of this, because in the homework it said demonstrate that each component of the spinner satisfies the Klein-Gordon equation. Um, when you look at the Dirac equation here, notice that there's a gamma matrix, okay? So this is a four by four matrix in spin space that is non-trivial, it's not the identity. And so when this gamma matrix acts on this spinner, it's gonna grab the components and mix them up. Okay, and, but then of course you're adding the original spinner. Okay, so this equation is doing something, it's combining different components of the spinner in a non-trivial way, okay? But once you've done the massaging to get it into the Klein-Gordon form, you'll notice that there is no non-trivial gamma matrix. You could put in a spin matrix if you want, but you would just put in the identity. So that means that if I look, remember these are four component things, I could call this psi one, psi two, psi three, psi four. If I look at the version of this equation for say the psi one component, I'll have the psi one component here and the psi one component there, which means that the psi one component satisfies the Klein-Gordon equation. And then I can do the same thing for the psi two component. You can't do that here because if you pick the psi one component of this, or sorry, the psi one component of this, it's gonna get combined with different components of psi by this gamma matrix, okay? So that's an important observation, and we're gonna build on that because I'm now going to make a little argument about this equation, okay? So, um, one thing that I can do with this equation to get a useful result is take the derivative of it, okay? 
So if I grab the Proko equation and I just act with d nu on everything, then the first term becomes d nu, d mu, f mu nu, and the second term becomes mc over h bar squared, d nu, a nu, and that of course equals zero still. Okay? So that's a completely unmotivated thing that I'm going to do. But watch what happens. Now there is a trick that gets bandied about a lot in sort of index manipulation. And we probably saw it a few times in GR. We haven't seen it in this course yet. Uh, but for now, I'm just going to ask you to buy it. And if any of you are in doubt, I can add it to your homework assignment to prove it explicitly. But at any rate, here we go. Here is an object with indices mu and nu, or nu and mu, it doesn't matter. And what's important is that since these are partial derivatives, I'm always free to swap their order. Everyone agree? So this is symmetric under the exchange of mu and nu. Okay? This object, on the other hand, remember how it's defined is explicitly anti-symmetric under the exchange because if I switch mu and nu, this term and this term swap, and so I get an overall minus sign. So this is anti-symmetric under exchanging mu and nu. Okay, now that's just an observation, but here's the very powerful tool. If I have something that is symmetric under the exchange of two indices, and those indices are fully contracted with another object which is anti-symmetric under the exchange of those two indices, this object is necessarily zero. And you don't have to take my word for it. Like, you can prove it in a very simple, like, you could just let mu and nu take values one and two, and then you can just prove that to yourself. Okay, for now, let's just, you can just accept it and we'll move on. Okay, but that's not some deep, weird, mysterious thing. That's something you can prove very, very uh, concretely. Okay, but now we see that if this is zero, this has to be zero. But of course, these set of constants are not going to be zero, so this implies that that term is zero. Okay? Now, the reason that that's valuable is because if I come back to the Proké equation and I actually expand this term into this form, then this becomes d mu d mu a mu minus d mu a mu uh, minus mc over h bar squared a mu equals zero. Okay? But now cast your eye to taking this term and putting it right there. Okay, I can move it past this d mu because again these are partials. But if I take this thing and I put it over here acting on a mu, what do I get? Zero. I get zero. I, I get exactly this, d mu a mu. It's just called d mu a mu here, but same difference. So this term disappears. And what I'm left with is d mu, d mu a mu minus mc over h bar squared a mu equals zero. Does anyone recognize that? It's only written twice on the board already. Oh yeah. That's the Klein-Gordon <laughs> equation. So we have the Klein-Gordon equation for a spin zero field. You demonstrated in your homework that the components of the Dirac field satisfy the Klein-Gordon equation, and I just demonstrated to you that the components of a vector field also satisfy the Klein-Gordon equation. The Klein-Gordon equation is up in everybody's business. It's all everywhere. In fact, if everything can be reduced to the Klein-Gordon equation, you might be asking yourself, why in the hell do we have the Dirac and the Proko equations? Okay. Yes, ma'am. Should there be a square on that C in the Klein Gordon equation? The top? At the top? Uh, no. No. No, there should not be a square here. Although that doesn't feel right to me. No, 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 no. There shouldn't be a square. 
There's a, there's a square in the term in the Lagrangian, but it's not squared in the, in the, in the equation of motion. I was, I was thinking in terms of the Lagrangian, because a mass term in the Lagrangian is always the field squared, but that's, that's my bad. Okay. Maybe that's why everyone was like, that's not the Klein-Gordon equation, because it's squared in the Klein-Gordon equation. Woohoo! Somehow you're willing to eat that, but whatever. All right, so, um, so the purpose of today's lecture is to explain two things, okay? One, why does the Klein-Gordon equation keep popping up? And two, given that, why do we have the Proca and the Dirac equations? Like, what do they tell us, okay? So um, to, to understand why everything satisfies the Klein-Gordon equation is actually uh, reasonably straightforward and actually makes contact with something that you might or might not have been shown in your quantum mechanics class. So let me see, am I brave enough to do this? Yeah, I think I am. Because all I'm doing is erasing the Klein-Gordon equation. Who needs it three times on the board? Come on. Okay. So let us take one of the uh, key things that comes out of formulating relativistic kinematics and dynamics, and that is this condition that the relativistic energy squared divided by C squared minus the spatial relativistic spatial momentum squared uh, is equal to M squared C squared. Okay? And remember, secretly, this is just P mu, P mu, evaluated in any frame where you can have the particle moving. But since this is an invariant, it must have the same value that you would get if you evaluated it in the rest frame, and that's the result in the rest frame. So this is really just saying that P mu, P mu in any frame is equal to P mu, P mu in the rest frame. That's all this is saying. It's a very like robust result from special relativity. Okay. So now let's take that expression and uh, clean it up just a bit. So I'm going to go ahead and just write it as P mu, P mu plus M squared, C squared equals zero. Again, this side is just P mu, P mu. Or, uh, sorry, uh, no, I, I lied. I'm sorry. There's some minuses that I'm forgetting. Uh, so this is P mu, P mu, and in the rest frame, P mu is mc zero vector. P mu is minus mc zero vector. So when I take the square of those, I'm going to get minus mc squared. So technically, uh, this is minus P mu, P mu. OK? Uh, so with that identification, this result follows. Keeping track of that minus sign is always very challenging because, uh, again, there's another convention in the literature where you take this as the metric. And if you take that as the metric, both of those are MC. So it's, it's really hard to keep track of this when you're looking at resources that switch conventions, but anyway. Okay, so uh, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to take that expression. Again, this is just the straightforward energy momentum condition in special relativity. And I am going to replace uh, the momentum with the usual quantum mechanical substitution IH bar d mu. Okay? Of course, this is a derivative, and so this is only going to make sense if I'm actually, I love the language, derivating something. I'm taking the derivative of something, so I'm going to make this replacement <coughs> and let this act on something. And I might as well just let it act on something I'll call phi. And if I do that, what I find is I get minus h bar squared d mu d mu phi plus m squared c squared phi equals zero. Does anyone recognize that? Is it the Klein-Gordon equation? That is the Klein-Gordon <laughs> equation. Well, you're so How smart. Do you know that? <laughs> Just, I was born that way. <laughs> okay? So secretly, what's going on with the Klein-Gordon <coughs> equation is that it is just enforcing that when a particle, no matter what kind of particle it is, whether it's a scalar, a spinner, or a vector, 
when it moves, when it has motion, energy and momentum, it's just enforcing this condition from special relativity. So all of the equations of motion, the Proca equation, the Dirac equation, the scalar Klein-Gordon equation itself, their solutions must satisfy this equation no matter what other interesting thing you're getting from due to the spin. And we'll talk about that in a moment. Okay? Now, um, you don't have to take my word for this. If this is like a new context and you don't really feel comfortable with that idea, let's just take something that you're probably a little more comfortable with. If we take p squared over 2m plus some potential, and we call that the total energy of a system, and then we do the usual replacement of p goes to minus i h bar del, and e goes to i h bar uh, d by dt. So these two replacements are sort of the non-relativistic breakdown of this replacement. Okay. But if you took those replacements and you plugged it into the definition of the energy in terms of kinetic plus potential, and then you edit, let it act on something we might as well call psi, you'll find an expression of the following form. Uh -oh. Am I trying to get in? Devin. Hi. We have a singing Valentine for you. For me? Thanks for you. <laughs> Do you mind if we interrupt class for a second? No, no. <laughs> Is it for me? You're on camera and you're going to be on YouTube. I just want you guys to be aware. You know we're okay with that. <laughs> there. Uh, can we get a chair up front for him to sit down? Here's the tall one. Oh my gosh. Make it scary to the camera. Yeah. Make sure that you're in front of the camera. Yeah. <laughs> you want to Let's start off with that. Okay. Yeah. Am I going to be peppered with kisses at some point? Yeah. Okay, good. Well, well, that's, that's actually <laughs> Ready? One, two. Yeah. You're all But it wouldn't be make-believe if you believed in me bum, bum, ba, do, yeah. Yes, it's only a canvas sky hey. Hanging over a muslin tree ba, do, do. But it wouldn't be make-believe if you believed in me Without your love It's a honky-tonk parade It's a melody played in a penny arcade It's a Barnum and Bailey world Just as phony as it can be But it wouldn't be make-believe If you believed in me Without your love It's a honky-tonk parade Without all your love It's a melody in a penny arcade it's a Barnum and Bailey world, just as phony as it can be. But it wouldn't be make believe if I had all your love. It's not make believe. I've got all your love. <laughs> Was a request oh my God. that we sing a song that's kind of inappropriate. <laughs> but so we just want to make sure that you're okay with it before we just kick in the door and you know whip it out. So to speak. Is it? Okay. Fine. <laughs> 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 I'm <not> scared. <laughs> I'm not lie. I'm not it's a great song. Have a seat. <laughs> we'll sing this one to the class. So okay. <laughs> Whenever life gets you down, keeps you wearing a frown, 
And the gritty train has left you behind And when you're all out of hope Down at the end of your rope And nobody's there to throw you a line If you ever get so low that you don't know which way to go Come on and take a walk in my shoes Never worry about a thing, got the world on a string Cause I've got the cure for all of my blues All of his blues I take a look at my enormous penis And the world will start melting away I take a look at my enormous penis And the happy times are coming to stay I gotta sing and I dance well parts about Family Guy are when they have these sort of weird things that go on longer than they should. <laughs> and it just gets really uncomfortable and I was like, that was, you know, I was like, 30 seconds, yes! <laughs> <laughs> Alright, um, yeah, yeah, what was this? <laughs> What is that? Schrodinger That's the time dependent Schrodinger equation. All oh, right, great. <laughs> I literally can't take anything seriously. <laughs> Good God. Okay. Um, you should just end class on a high note. <laughs> no, no, it's it's gonna be good. It's is gonna. Be, I mean, we're not gonna have an enormous penis or anything. <laughs> well, I'm just gonna stop that. <laughs> and uh, I'm gonna talk about some gentlemen. Um, all right. So, uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right. Uh, what was I saying? So, um, some stuff. Yeah. Any questions about stuff? <laughs> Who did that? You, are you the one that asked me? And he said he's going to sing into Wolfgang. <laughs> which, which I, you were like, you were really pulling it. My heart's just like, of course you can sing to Wolfgang. <laughs> I'll sing to Wolfgang. <laughs> and then I'm on the heart. <laughs> It's, it's insane. Okay, um, so it's actually not bad. We'll have plenty of time. So, any questions about uh, sort of why the Klein Gordon equation is popping up everywhere? It doesn't matter what you are. If you're an excitation that looks like a particle, you can move. And your energy and momentum have to satisfy this relationship, and that's just reflected in the Klein Gordon equation. That's all it is. Kowalski. But 
time independent or sorry, time dependent Schrodinger equation, that's is that some form of the Klein Gordon equation, like a non -relative? No, 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 no. I'm saying if if this if this uh, if this prescription right here looks foreign or new to you, I'm just showing you the exact same type of argument in a context you're more familiar with, which is non-relativistic quantum mechanics. Sure. Okay. Yeah, I'm not. This is not supposed to inspire this. It's oh, okay. just supposed to uh, be a more comfortable example of the same thing. Okay. Um, all right. So now we're going to turn to the question of. Okay, we kind of know why the Klein-Gordon is popping up. The Klein-Gordon is buried in here, and it's buried in here. It's the only thing that's here. So what else do these things have? Okay, and there's a very interesting story that emerges from this. So uh, the first thing we have to talk about in order to make sense of this is the question of uh, what, um, what, what can we say about degrees of freedom? It doesn't sound like the sexiest topic, but it's actually a pretty interesting one. Um, <laughs> yeah, I really had no idea what they were going to sing for that second song. <laughs> and I don't know if I was, if my fear was exceeded, or I don't know, anyway, it's fine. Okay, so um, in, in, uh, in a normal situation, so in a normal situation when you have uh, like particle-like degrees of freedom, which bear in mind we have fields, so it's more, it's more subtle. When you have particle-like degrees of freedom, uh, there's sort of two ways of defining your degrees of freedom if you want. You can talk about the dimension uh, of the configuration space. <laughs> configuration space. Or you can talk about half the dimension of phase space. So just to give you a really rudimentary example, if I have like a particle and it's in three spatial dimensions, okay, the configuration space is really just the space of possible positions of that particle. That is obviously three dimensions, right? So in this example, the dimension of configuration space, because configuration space is the number of configurations you can put your system in and there's there's obviously an infinite number, but there's three dimensions to it. So in this case, it's 3D. But the phase space associated with this would be the three spatial dimensions where you can put it, but then you tack onto it the various momenta that you can give the particle. And so phase space is typically twice as big as configuration space. So either one does the counting for you, okay? Now this is all well and good if you're just looking at a particle or, yeah. You say typically, is, that, is there any case where the phase space is not the same, it's not twice as big as No, 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 it's, well, uh, there are subtleties in identifying uh, phase space. So the Dirac equation is actually an example of where it's kind of subtle to distinguish between phase space and configuration space because the conjugate momentum to the Dirac field is not actually the derivative of the Dirac field, it's actually the adjoint spinner. So I, I wouldn't say that the, the, the counting changes, but the identification of the phase space can be a little bit weird in certain contexts. Okay? So um, if you have n particles, then you just you multiply this by n because if you have, you know, if you have two particles, they each can be placed throughout these three dimensions independently. Okay? So the configuration space would have six dimensions in that case three for each, and then the phase space would have 12 and so forth and so on. So we're not talking about particles, we're talking about fields. And so for fields it gets a little more subtle. Um, in principle there are an infinite number of degrees of freedom if you have a field, because in principle the field value at each point of space-time constitutes an independent degree of freedom. Okay. So the counting is going to be done a little bit differently, um, and fortunately um, uh, there is a program for determining the number of degrees of freedom that was invented by um, uh, Eugene Wigner, who's sort of the god of uh, applying abstract algebra and group theory in physics. And it's called uh, Wigner's uh, classification or the method of induced representations. So um, just to give you an idea of how this works and the results that are going to be useful for us um, is the following. 
So uh, what we want to do is, first of all, we want to um, let the particle have some, you know, momentum. Okay, we want to give it some momentum. It's, it's a quantum system, so we don't necessarily try and specify momentum and uh, position. And one thing that we know, and you can go and you can calculate the degrees of freedom associated with this in the same way that I just laid out the dimension of configuration space or phase space. What, what we want to do is look at the additional counting that you get when you take into account the fact that the particle or the field in question has spin because that's clearly going to change the number of degrees of freedom. So uh, if we just, first of all, let our particle have some momentum, then what we're interested in doing is finding the degrees of freedom associated with our particle, i.e. the things that we can change without changing the momentum. The momentum degree of freedom itself is already encoded in the Klein-Gordon equation. So what we want to know is what else can you do to the particle without changing the prescription for its momentum, okay? So, uh, so what are we going to do? Okay, so here's, here's the good news. Um, if, I, if I set my particle out with some four momentum, so this is a space-time four momentum, if I set it out with some, in some trajectory with some four momentum, and I do the counting and, and decide, oh wow, there's like two degrees of freedom that I still can change, okay? That answer should not change if I pick a different four momentum. Like giving it a four momentum that way or a four momentum that way shouldn't change the number of degrees of freedom that are left. Like the number of degrees of freedom are this more intrinsic thing that doesn't hinge on like the choice of what direction you're going to <coughs> okay? Moreover, it really shouldn't matter whether I'm actually got the thing moving with a non-zero velocity or not. I could pick any frame I want and as long as I write the four momentum correctly in that frame, then I should be able to use any frame to decide what the re residual degrees of freedom are. Well, if we can pick any frame we want, what frame do we always pick? The rest, rest frame. The rest frame, okay? <coughs> so in the rest frame, P mu takes a very simple form, which we just wrote, MC zero vector, okay? And now the question that we want to pose is, the degrees of freedom that I'm dealing with are going to correspond in some way to space-time transformations, okay? Every degree of freedom that we're talking about, unless we're talking about some internal degrees of freedom, which we'll talk about later in the course, but right now we're talking about space-time degrees of freedom. So, you know, this is the freedom to, to move in space-time. Spin is intrinsically related to space-time transformations through the rotation group. So my question is, is if I think of the set of transformations in four dimensions, which of these, sorry, well, that's a one three. <laughs> which, of, which of these transformations is going to leave the form of that unchanged? If I do a boost, will mm -hmm. it change that momentum? Yeah, a boost will change the momentum, so I don't want to include the boosts. So what am I left with? Rotations. The rotation group. Okay. The rotation group in three spatial dimensions. Okay, now this has a technical name in this context. If this is the group of space-time transformations, this is called the little group. <laughs> I'm not kidding. Okay. So we choose, we have a set of space-time transformations. We choose a particular momentum associated with our degree of freedom. And this part of the story can change, and it will later on. But once we fix that, we ask, what is the residual set of space-time transformations which leaves that momentum invariant? And that is what we identify as the little group of isometries of the space-time. Okay? And the idea now is that this is the group we should be using to describe the residual degrees of freedom, the transformations you can do which don't change p mu, all right? 
Now, in this case, it's obvious, right? Because you know, there's something there, and then there's a zero there. And as long as I use transformation matrices, which do not try to mix these two, I can do anything I want. And that's exactly SO3. It's not nearly as obvious that that would be the case if I chose a more general momentum. So if this was some E over C uh, P vector. But it turns out that you, you, still, you still have the same scenario. In this case, it's just not nearly as transparent. I got hands across America back here, Spencer. Um, so if we consider the spatial rotations of a particle that's not moving, those seem pretty general. Like, is that what we're considering? Uh, the spa oh, oh, so, so I, I think, yeah. So, um, so I'm going to draw something, and then I, I want you to just think very carefully about it. Okay, so our particle here is not moving. So granted, we're talking about a field, not a particle, but we can talk about a field excitation that behaves like a particle, and that field excitation happens to be at rest. Okay, but this thing has spin. So if you were really loosey-goosey and drew like a little spin vector, you're now asking, what can I do to that spin vector? And what I'm saying is that to classify what states you're allowed for the spin vector, you just need to look at the group SO3, okay? But the good news is, is that you're all very familiar with this. You've been looking at representations of spin and SO3 from the first days you took quantum mechanics back in modern physics, okay? So in particular, there's a whole slew of results that you can make use of. So let's talk a little bit about spin in quantum mechanics, and then, yeah, that will actually bring us to the end. So we can talk about good old non-relativistic quantum mechanical spin, and the rules that follow from that analysis, and that's going to apply, in this case, to the little group. This is a relativistic system, but we're, we're trying to describe the degrees of freedom that are sort of independent of the space-time momentum. And so we just get to use this group, which is the isometry group of non-relativistic quantum mechanics. Okay, so what we know from uh, quantum mechanics is that uh, spin, in contrast uh, to, well, actually, uh, let me see. Hold on. So first of all, in quantum mechanics, angular momentum is always quantized. And I don't know if I mentioned this earlier in the semester. I know I've mentioned it in another context. But is everything in quantum mechanics quantized? No. No. When is something quantized? When it's constrained. When it's constrained. Actually, when the parameter underlying whatever the wave function is, when the parameter has some bounds. So you, if you have a particle that's free to move on the x-axis and the x-axis is infinite, its momentum takes a continuum of values. But the minute you confine it to a box so that its x position can only be between 0 and L, its momentum becomes quantized. Okay? Well, angular momentum is talking about rotations, but the rotation parameter is always bound from 0 to 2 pi. So there's no escaping quantization of angular momentum in quantum mechanics. All right? Now, um, for so we we in quantum mechanics encounter L and S that is orbital angular momentum and spin angular momentum and orbital angular momentum is really just the quantum mechanical generalization of that quantity that you met first in physics one that is you take the position vector with respect to some origin you cross it with the momentum vector and that's the orbital angular momentum about the, uh, the origin. Um, spin, on the other hand, although it behaves very similar to orbital, ang orbital angular momentum, cannot be given a sort of space-time picture. It's truly just an internal property of the particle that you're studying, and there is no microscope that will zoom you in close enough and let you actually see the thing spinning, okay? And there's a lot of arguments as to why that's the case. One of the arguments that you can make for why that's the case is um, in quantum mechanics, even though this is quantized, if you look at the eigenvalue of L squared, that's the square of the total orbital angular momentum, you can change this, right? You could have an object which, is, which has 
non-zero orbital angular momentum, so you could like have a, an electron orbiting some, some atom or some, some nucleus, and you can go in and interact with that electron, strip it away, put it at rest, and then it would have zero orbital angular momentum. So for a quantum system, you can change the value of the orbital angular momentum, okay? However, for a quantum system, once you've specified the spin magnitude, this is fixed forever and always. So if I say I have a spin a half particle, there is no changing that it's a spin a half particle. If I say I have a spin one particle, it is spin one forever and always. So that's just one of the many things that, that reflect the difference between this orbital angular momentum and spin angular momentum, okay? Now, orbital angular momentum is quantized or its allowed values take integer, or its allowed values take integer, or it takes integer values, whereas we know that because spin is not tied to space-time, you just get it from the algebra, you're free to introduce half integer values for the spin Okay, it's, it's just allowed, just in the same way that when we did spinner representations of the Lorenz group, you know, they were allowed, but then you have to ask the question, does nature actually exhibit those? And you all know from hopefully one of your quantum mechanics courses that the stern gerlach experiment explicitly shows us that there's spin a half particles because you send in the particles, they split into two paths, and you can't explain that for any spin system except the spin a half system. Yeah, Jacob. Because that also says there could be like spin one third or one fourth or whatever. Does what say? That. No, no, it's it's integer and half integer, and that's it. Okay. You can't do. Yeah, you can't can't do thirds and so forth. So, and then, and that's reflective of the representations of the Lorentz transformations too. Okay, so um, once we've set the spin of whatever we're dealing with in non-relativistic quantum mechanics, it's the spin of the particle you're studying. Okay, you still have some residual degree of freedom, right? because we haven't specified the alignment of the spin, okay? And then that's where you get this interesting counting. So if I say I have a spin zero particle, and I go and I measure its spin component along some chosen axis, which I'll just call Z, well, I'm guaranteed that this is gonna be zero, because if it doesn't have any spin, its Z component is gonna be zero. If the spin is a half, then you're all familiar with the notion that I have two outcomes for measuring the spin along Z. I can get plus or minus a half, and that's of course the splitting of the stern gerlach uh, in the stern gerlach experiment. And then if the spin is one, then I then get three values. Okay? Everything all right over there? Okay, and you can follow this, you can follow this to an arbitrarily high spin. If you do spin three halves, then you just start at three halves and you walk in integer steps down to negative three halves. Okay? So, um, everybody reasonably comfortable with this idea? Okay, so for a spin zero particle, after you've said where the particle is or how fast it's moving, there's nothing left to specify. For a spin a half particle, even if I tell you where it is and how fast it's going, I still have two degrees of freedom. How much of, how much of it is spin up and how much of it is spin down? Are those really like two separate degrees of freedom? Yeah, so you can think of this, you can think of the, the state vector as a superposition okay. of the spin up and the spin down okay. eigenkets. Yeah. And then you've got coefficients that go in front of those. And then if I have a spin one particle at rest, then I've got a basis in the Hilbert space that's three-dimensional, and so I have three degrees of freedom. Matt? If we define that as, like, say, A times up plus B times down, wouldn't that still be one degree of freedom because there's a uh, specified number of particles? Aren't the, aren't the two related? The number of well, so for, for the two-dimensional case, they're complex coefficients, but then they have to be normalized. Okay. So you can reduce it to two real degrees of freedom. Okay. So, um, and there's, there's, there's some extra bits to the quantum story. So I, I say that this is approximately zero. We know that if you actually measure the, the S squared eigenvalue, then it's controlled by the spin parameter uh, to give you values S times S plus one times H squared. 
And then you get this nice result, which hopefully was pointed out to you in quantum, that this immediately tells you that the total spin squared is always going to be greater than uh, SZ squared. Okay? Because SZ squared is just going to be S squared H bar squared. So if I really and truthfully measured the spin squared quantum number, I measured the magnitude of spin, I get these results. Okay? But these are bigger than the square of the Z component. Can anybody explain why that has to be the case? Have you seen this observation in your quantum class? Because then you have your entire angular momentum perfectly localized in the Z direction. Exactly. If you could somehow get SZ to be the same as S, that would be saying that all of your spin was along the Z axis, and then you would identic you would simultaneously know SZ, SX, and SY, which is not allowed. Okay, so this is the best you can do. Okay. So, now we, we have a sense of how many degrees of freedom we should expect for various things. If we're describing uh, scalar fields, after we've talked about the momentum freedom from the Klein-Gordon part, there should be nothing left, and that's exactly what we see, because all we have is the Klein-Gordon equation. For the Dirac case, after we've removed the freedom of just having momentum, that's the Klein-Gordon part, we should be left with two degrees of freedom. And then for the spin one case, we should be left with three degrees of freedom. Okay? Now when I look at these things, uh, from, the, from the start, it doesn't seem like the degrees of freedom are, are matching because psi is a complex four component thing. So there's eight real degrees of freedom in there. And here, A nu is a real three component thing, or a real four component thing, sorry. Okay? So I expect two here, but I'm starting naively with eight. I'm expecting three here, but I'm starting naively with four. And what we're going to discover is that these equations do exactly what they need to do to reduce the eight to what it should be and to reduce the four to what it should be. Wait. So Sorry. I'm just going to do, I'm going to do this in an, in an example. Well, Reducing the four, isn't there like four degrees of freedom for momentum and then three more for the spin? With like seven? Or? Sorry, so the so I'm looking at the degrees of freedom beyond the degrees of freedom to just move and have momentum, because that's already captured in the Klein Gordon part of it. Okay. Remember okay. these have Klein Gordon in them. Okay. And I'm trying to unearth A, what are the degrees of freedom above and beyond the freedom to just move? And what is contained in these equations over and above the Klein-Gordon? Because okay, they already contain the Klein-Gordon. I want to see what else do they contain, or what else are they doing. Okay? So let's, <clears throat> let's start with the vector case. Uh, so for the vector case, yeah, here we go. So I'm going to take my Proca equation. And remember, to, to cleanly classify the degrees of freedom uh, that are uh, aside from the Klein-Gordon, the simplest thing to do is to, first of all, go to momentum space. So that you're talking about P mu instead of D mu. And then once you're in momentum space, you just give the thing a momentum vector that satisfies the Klein-Gordon equation. That way, that part is already taken care of. So let's do uh, as we did before, but in the opposite order. So we're going to replace any derivative terms that we see with the momentum operator. And conversely, if we just replace the derivative, that's going to be minus i over h bar times the corresponding dual momentum. These are the same thing. Okay. And then I'm just going to come up into this expression. Everywhere I see a derivative, I'm going to make that replacement. Okay? So remember, this term is full of derivatives as well. So when I crunch all this through, I'm going to find from this guy, minus i over h bar p mu, and then a minus i over h bar p mu, a mu, plus i over h bar p mu, a mu, minus 
mc over h bar squared a nu equals zero. Okay. Now, to, to go ahead and sort of ignore the Klein-Gordon part, we just give this thing a momentum vector that satisfies the Klein-Gordon equation, that satisfies the energy-momentum relationship from special relativity. But of course, let's pick the simplest one. Let's pick the one in the rest frame. So if I use that P mu is minus MC zero, or P mu is MC zero, and I plug that in here everywhere I see P dual or P upper mu, okay? Then I essentially have two versions of this equation. I've not called very many names today, so Rochelle. How many different equations does this expression represent? How many scalar equations, or how many component equations does it represent? Yeah, it's four equations, one for each value of nu, because the mu is summed over. So we could look at what this equation looks like when nu is equal to zero, and then we can look at what it looks like when it's a spatial index. We'll just do one spatial index because it's the same for all of them, okay? So now I, this is literally plug and chug. I have an expression for the dual momentum. When I sum the dual momentum contracted with the momentum, what am I going to get? You, well, if you want. I don't. <laughs> you don't? So anybody, anybody? Franco. So if I do P mu, P mu, using those vectors and dual vectors, what am I going to get? You're just going to get in the rest frame, right? So you're just yeah. going to get the MC uh, squared thing. MC whole thing. Squared with a minus sign. Right. Yeah, OK. So I'm just going to write the result because I'm just trusting you all could go through and do this. And so if I plug all this in, I'm going to find uh, for the new equals zero part, whatever h bar squared, mc squared a zero plus whatever h bar squared, mc squared a zero <coughs> minus mc over h bar quantity squared a zero. And that has to equal zero. OK, this term just comes from this guy. This term comes from the contraction of that, and then that's just that guy, where I'm setting nu equal to zero everywhere. Yeah. So this term cancels. They're all three the same term, yeah. just with different signs. So two of them cancel. I'm left with one of them. But in order for that to vanish, what does A not have to be? Zero. So this tells me that A0 is zero. zero. If I look at a spatial term, then this actually, the spatial term, this one disappears. Because if this is I, this is the part of the spatial momentum, but that's zero. So I only have this term and this term. And in that case, I just have 1 over h bar squared mc squared ai minus mc over h bar squared ai equals zero, which is trivially satisfied. Okay? So what I find is that even though I start off with A nu having four real degrees of freedom, the Proca equation itself is acting to reduce that to three by forcing me to set one of them to zero. But that is exactly what we expect from this Wigner classification scheme. Because I go to the rest frame of the spin one particle, the little group is SO3, and a spin one particle in three spatial dimensions has three degrees of freedom. Matt. No matter what form momentum you pick, would it result in A0 equaling zero, or no. A0 equal a constant? No. It doesn't necessarily have to, it doesn't have to end up with A0 being zero. Okay. It's a, it's a, well, okay, so first of all, for, for an arbitrary form of momentum, this is a much harder thing Sorry. to do. A different form of momentum that satisfies time board. 
Oh, you, you have to pick a form of momentum that satisfies Klein Gordon, but it won't necessarily come to this same restriction. It, but what it will do is it will reduce you from four to three. Okay. It might just not set A zero to zero. Now, all this being said, we are going to look at examples of this classification when the form momentum is not zero. In fact, we're going to be forced to. In fact, you might be sitting there wondering, what if it's massless? Yeah. And we're going to come to that in the next topic. We're not going to get to it today. For now, what I want to do is repeat this analysis now with the Dirac equation. Okay? So we're going to do something very similar. Just this time we're going to be working with spinners. So again, what I'm trying to convey to you is that, before I get to the Dirac example, this equation for a spin one field contains the Klein-Gordon equation, but it also contains essentially constraints that reduce the degrees of freedom associated with the spin from the naive four down to what we expect is the three. So similarly with the Dirac equation, we should expect this equation to take the eight components here and reduce it to what? Two. Two. All right, so let's see that happen. So I'm going to take the Dirac equation. We'll just take not the adjoint form, but the <coughs> original form. And I'm going to use my substitution to go to momentum space. Plug that bad boy in. And then I'm going to go to the rest frame. OK. And if I go to the rest frame, this is actually going to reduce. I only have a non-zero P0 component. That's P0. So that means I'm only going to be using gamma 0. Okay. Uh, P lower mu is minus MC and gamma zero. Just put, put it in there. Okay. So if I pull this, if I if I create an overall operator acting on psi, factor out the MC, I get something like that. And now, folks, you, you don't. You can you can calculate explicitly what this thing is, right? I gamma zero plus one. You know what gamma zero is. It's a matrix you can play around with in your homework. We've seen it in class. So I'm just going to write down what that matrix ends up, ends up being. It's actually a very nice matrix. Where each of these is a two by two identity matrix. Okay, so you, you got to be a little bit careful when you're going from block form. So one, one, zero, zero. Okay. So we can now take this, MC is just a number, and we can let it act on uh, psi 1, psi 2, psi 3, psi 4, where these are ostensibly four complex components, so eight parameters, four complex parameters. And if we do that, what we find is, and you can do the matrix multiplication in your head, the MC doesn't matter because it's equal to zero. But literally, if you just do this matrix multiplication, you're going to find psi 1 plus psi 2, psi 3 plus psi 4, or sorry, psi 1 plus psi 3, psi 2 plus psi 4, psi 1 plus psi 3, psi 2 plus psi 4, equals 0. But this is just telling me that psi 1 equals minus psi 3 and psi 2 equals minus psi 4. So what are we left with? It's 4. It's not 2. We can pick any two of these and then the other two are determined, but these are complex. So we're left with four real or two complex degrees of freedom. That is not what we expected. If they're real, it's two real. You hang in tight there? If they're if what are real? If you pick real values, then you have two <coughs> real values, but if they're complex, you've got four, right? 
Well, how many you can pick is based on whether they're complex or not. It's not what you do pick, it's what you can pick, it's what you're free to pick. Okay? So we just found that Wigner's classification scheme failed. Because for a spin a half particle, we expected to only have two degrees of freedom left over after we specify the momentum. So after we remove the Klein-Gordon part, we expected to get two spin states, spin up and spin down, but we have gotten four left over. But this does not represent a failure of the Dirac equation. It actually represents a wisdom of the Dirac equation. What does the Dirac equation remember that we, or what does the Dirac equation know about that we haven't talked about? Antimatter. Antimatter. So there are, in fact, four or two complex residual degrees of freedom because the Dirac equation actually describes both electrons and anti electrons, each of which are spin a half particles and have two degrees of freedom. Now, right now, I'm just th I'm throwing antimatter at you as an explanation for why you have so many degrees of freedom. When we come together next time, we're actually going to solve the Dirac equation and identify the antiparticle solutions. Okay, and then that'll further support this, this recognition that that's actually uh, constituting this balance of the degrees of freedom that we're getting out of this. Okay, so we'll do that next time. Thanks for the singing telegram. <laughs> oh, Valentine's, sorry. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a